Okay, so here we go. So here's um, the team members, Minhao Yang, who couldn't attend either today, Cheng Gao, Inia Siolini, Adrian Huber, Jit Hender, Anamula, uh, Ilya Kizilev, and Danny Neal. And in the picture, you see the names with the person. We had to paste a couple of people in because they weren't in the, in the group shot that we did at some point, yeah. And so anyway, uh, just to, to mention uh, briefly about the background. So, so to do this work, uh, we actually needed um, uh, students from different backgrounds because it was quite important to not just have um, just the students who did the electronic design, but also the ones that did the algorithms, the one who understood about signal processing because we're talking about audio and you know there's a lot of work that's done in audio. So you have to understand where the field is at also. And also, um, uh, students are very good in, in, um, in electronics. So, so here's Minhao Yang, who did some of the designs, the cochlear designs that I'll talk about. Ilya Kizilev, who did a lot of the hardware infrastructure around the designs. Um, Inea, Danny, Jithender, they were just wonderful. They developed a lot of the network algorithms and Danny developed also some of the hardware. And Adrian Huber, who, um, who developed some of the, uh, the signal processing theory for this asynchronous uh, signals that come out of the cochlea. And so um, I just briefly speak about uh, where this design came from. And so as Terry has mentioned, so with the biological cochlea, um, you get a traveling wave that um, propagates down the membrane when there's the sound of a certain frequency that comes in. And if you look at the uh, transfer functions, then you, you see that they look a bit like a bandpass transfer function and there's a very high roll off. By the way, do you see my cursor? Yes. Yeah, okay. All right. And so it was um, Carver Mead and Dick Blind who made an electronic cochlear model that uh, models this wave propagation and they in this paper in 1988, they actually mentioned that you can uh, model it using a cascaded set of um, second order section filters. In fact, in this particular design, there were 480 stages. I think nobody <laughs> after that <laughs> designed a cochlear with that many stages. Yeah. And of course the, um, the cochlea is more than just a membrane. Actually what sits on top of membrane are a set of cells, the inner hair cells and the outer hair cells. And also you get the efferent axons that go out of the cochlea and of course those produce spikes. And so um, as, as Terry had mentioned, there were a number of students in Carver Means Group that developed a lot of interesting designs, improved designs that make the cochlea more usable to somebody else. And I, I just put up um, a set of pictures here. So Rahul Sapeshka, Lloyd Watts, and also in Switzerland, Eric Vitos had a, a set of students also working on the cochlea. And here's Andre Van Chaik, I want to mention because he, um, he was the one who designed the cochlea. So there was very little matching. Oh no, there was very good matching between the uh, output of the, of the different filters. In fact, he's the one that I, I started working on the cochlear design with because we were in Telluride and, you know, basically we got together and say, well, we have to design a chip that can compete with the DVS. And so that's how kind of the whole thing got started up. And then before I, I uh, show now the dynamic audio sensor board, I also uh, want to acknowledge uh, Corbena, who developed a lot of this uh, AER circuits that we use on our, our chips. And also uh, Toby had developed the hardware infrastructure for the DVS, which we actually then mapped onto to the dynamic audio sensor or the DAS as we call it. Okay, and so I just kind of show you the timeline. So here's the, the DAS in 2013. So you can see it's here in this package, the two microphones coming in. And at the time, the specs, it's a binaural cochlea, 64 frequency channels, and you can, um, record the spikes that come out the cochlea. So here are the channels ranging from 20 to 20 kilohertz. And then uh, you see the stream of spikes that come through, they're in different colors, yellow, uh, and uh, indicates when the red spikes and the green spikes from the two years coincide. And so the idea is to be able to use the timing information that you see in the spikes. And in 2016, um, in this design with Minhao Yang, he, he actually did a, a lovely analog design where matching across all the 64 channels. And this is for a very high Q of 10. And if you play a chirp, which is a, a sound where the frequency increases over time, then you can see for the 64 channels, only a small set of channels will fire, right? As the frequency changes. 
And also the, the power consumption was only 55 microwatts for the spinal cochlea. And so it allowed us to uh, start looking at algorithms that use the output of the cochlea. And I also want to uh, quickly show the, the output of this cochlea to, to show you that it really is usable, right? So you can play a sentence from Timit. It's a favorite sentence of Shihab Sharma. So she had your dark suit in greasy wash water all year, right? And so if you compute the input spectrogram, you, set, you see the set of patterns that go with the words in the sentence. And if you now play this to the cochlea and look at the cochleogram, then again, you can see that there are very similar patterns that you get in the spikes that come out from the different channels. And you can take the spikes and do a reconstruction just to see whether the information is still there. And so here's the original sound. She had your duck suit and greasy wash water. Oh, I should share my, can you hear the sound? Oh, no, you, we hear it. We hear it. We okay. actually hear it. Okay, and here's the reconstruction. Can you play it again? Play it again? Play it again a couple times. She had the duck suit and greasy wash water all year. Yeah. And then this is the reconstructed sound from the spikes. She had your duck suit and greasy wash water all year. Right. So you can understand what the person's speaking. And so um, so from here, I think we could do a lot of uh, develop a lot of interesting algorithms. She had your and of course, because of spike timing, we can do things like localization where you can use inter all time difference of uh, spikes coming from the left and right ear to tell you where a sound source is in space. But I want to skip on and talk about our uh, more recent work where uh, we look basically for, for the kind of um, audio algorithms that you might want to run on edge devices. And, and this is actually a, a very hot area where, where people are looking for uh, low power uh, processors, right, that you can uh, deploy out in the world especially with the billions of IoT devices that, that people are using nowadays, like earbuds and audio assistants. And so three of three tasks that's pretty common for, for this area is voice activity detection, keyword spotting, and speech recognition. And the metrics that are very important for this edge devices is that you worry about power, you worry about latency, and then you also worry about accuracy, right? So it's not something that, um, we usually think about when we build our neuromorphic circuits, but because we have to show that this neuromorphic technology is actually uh, competitive with what's out there, we have to start um, pushing into that direction. And so basically we're comparing ourselves where we have an event-based sensor going to an event-based processor against the more conventional solution where you have um, a, a sensor like a microphone and then you have an analog digital converter that comes after uh, that gets you the uh, samples and then you pass it to a clock processor, right? And we, uh, we want to see whether we can still get the same accuracy for less power and for lower latency. And so now I'm just give you a quick timeline of all the things that happened that led us to where we are today. And so around 2014 was when uh, Danny built, I think our first SNN FPGA accelerator platform. The reason why we, oh, by the way, he called it Minotaur because he had such a difficult time while building it before he got it to work. And the idea was to interface it to the DVS and to, to see that we can actually run these algorithms in real time. And then um, the other thing that was important was because the deep learning became um, a state of art method that many uh, problems are solved, uh, we had to figure out whether we could build e equivalent accurate SNNs that work just as well on benchmark tasks. And a few students in the, in the institute, including Danny, developed these training methods for ANNs that you can then convert into equivalent accurate SNNs. And um, because we're mapping to hardware, we started worrying about bit precision, right? Because this is usually done with floating point precision back then. And, and really six years ago, this is, I think, one of the early learning rules that came out from, for the community where we developed, uh, actually it was Daniel who developed this, what we call the dual copy learning rule that allowed you to uh, train the network so that it's still highly accurate, even at low bit precision. And it's because we were trying to map the networks to Spinnaker that we worried about this because you couldn't just take the trained networks and run it down to a single bit and expect it to work just as well. And through this training method, we could get a, a network that worked almost as well as say a 16 bit network. And so this was very important for us. 
And finally, yes, and then we had a, a fusion, a sensor fusion system where we can now take Minotaur and interface it to DBS and DES and start doing uh, all kinds of experiments with the system. And also in 2017, um, we came up with this uh, new idea for, for the network where we take a normal ANN and then we treat it kind of like an SNN in the sense that we don't, when we time step the network, we don't update all the neurons all the time, but we only update neurons that uh, the change of the activation of the neurons have exceeded a threshold. So it's, a, it's we're taking this inspiration from biology and we're running this ANNs like SNNs and we call this Delta networks. And uh, we showed that if you run the Delta RNN on uh, benchmark uh, data sets, like even Wall Street Journal, large data sets that it still works great and we save on computes. And so now everything boils down to this architecture. We're gonna have the cochlea with the multiple channels creating spikes, gonna get features, and then we're gonna feed it to uh, this network, the Delta network. And then we're gonna use it to solve all kinds of tasks, right? Which I, I lay out here again. And um, Cheng Gao uh, developed the system to show proof of concept. So here's the cochlea board going to an FPGA that runs the Delta RNA. And uh, the set of papers, they give the numbers of the power latency, et cetera. But I want to show you what happens is when you know that your system is working, you can take it and then you can shrink everything into an ASIC. And so here's an example of a voice activity detection ASIC presented by Minhao at ISSCC in 2019. And it has only eight cochlear channels. And on the same ASIC, he had a binary uh, MLP, multi-layer perceptron. And this whole thing burns only one microwatt. And this chip is extremely small. And if you take a, a five cent Swiss coin, which is 17 millimeters, well, this chip here is only like one tenth, right, of the area. So just to show you how small you can make it and how low power you can make it. And you can push things like this into, you know, something like the earbuds, which is burning um, about uh, 10 milliwatts or so just for the computation. And, and at ISCC, which is a kind of the, the place where a lot of people are developing kind of state-of-art designs in, in this audio edge circuits, you know, there's a lot of interest in keyword spotting. So here's a, a, another design a year later where they tried to compete by uh, using MFCC features and putting a binary CNN and um, they burn about 540 nanowatts, but this doesn't include the ADC power because you do have to do the ADC before you can compute the MFCC features. And so I think it's very exciting here because it's kind of a journey where we, uh, we're going to see um, how much we can shrink the chips along with the power, the latency, maintain the accuracy, and understand at what point um, we can bring our neuromorphic technology to a place where we can show that it's, it's as useful as uh, conventional solutions, or maybe even better, right? Because there are other properties of, uh, of this device, for example, um, this event-driven way of computing where you don't compute till uh, that signal is present in the, in the scene, okay? And yeah, of course, there's still all the, the usual uh, more interest, uh, other interesting things that we will continue to do where we try to understand about how you can merge uh, spikes from different sensors. Yeah. And that's all. And I want to uh, lastly acknowledge uh, any forum for co coordinating this prize, uh, the extended members of the census group at INI and also the institute members, uh, really the Telluride Neuromorphic Cognition Engineering Workshop for discussions around the cochlear work, also where Andre and I met for the initial designs. And also want to thank Shihab Shama and Malcolm Slaney, who throughout all these years, he, they've continuously challenged me about, you know, how, how uh, useful is the cochlear? You know, what's the information in the cochlear that makes us want to switch over to another solution? So I so really value that because um, we had uh, some really good discussions in this area. Also, the, the European Union and Swiss National Science Foundation agencies that funded most of the work that I described here. And also, thanks to all of you for being here. And also, to, yeah, congratulations to the team members. <laughs> <laughs>